Let's summarize the entirety of the book Utopia. At the onset of Utopia, Moore provides a number of made up but intriguing items in a section called the front matter, which include poems and an alphabet in the Utopian language, maps of Utopia, and letters that supposedly verify the existence of Utopia. After the front matter, book one describes a trip that Moore took to Flanders in modern day Belgium. There he met up with his friend Peter Giles and the fictional Raphael Hithloday. Hithloday, it turns out, has traveled with the real life Amerigo Vespucci to the New World, the Americas, and then went off on his own to discover the fictional island of Utopia. Much of book one, which is much shorter than book two, is made up of socio-political debates among Moore, Hithloday, and Giles, centered around punishments for theft. Hithloday describes a discussion he had with a variety of real and made up men at a dinner party hosted by the Archbishop of Canterbury. At the end of book one, Hithloday begins to tell the gathered group about the amazing culture and politics of Utopia, whose rules are both different than Tudor England's, yet are highly functional. Book two consists of an in-depth description of the physical, social, and cultural aspects of Utopia and is narrated by Hithloday. While book one has no chapters, book two has nine, which include explanations of how utopians do things. First, there's the description of Utopia, a chapter that focuses on the geography and geology of the country, along with details about its many harbors, 54 cities, and essential farms. Chapter two explains the layout of utopian cities and gardens, as well as shared property. Chapter three describes the government and justice system of Utopia. Chapter four covers utopian work, which everyone does, and how there's no money, so no one is richer than anyone else. Chapter five describes the family structure of the utopians and the very specific rules by which the society is organized. This chapter also describes how the sick and injured are cared for. Chapter six explains how utopians travel from city to city, but they must ask for permission to do so. All men live in full view of one another, so no one can break a rule without being noticed. Chapter seven deals with utopian slaves, mainly consisting of criminals and the poorest members of other neighboring societies, and also how women have more rights and privileges than was common during Thomas More's time, and even fewer than are common today. Divorce is possible, but not common. Chapter eight covers the military and how utopians detest war, but when they do fight, they do so with the aim of avoiding bloodshed by any means necessary. And nine, of the religions of the Utopians. In Utopia, there are many religions. People may worship many different things, but all agree in the idea of a supreme being. Here, Hithloday delivers a blistering indictment of the way things are done in Tudor England, particularly their religious systems, criticizing the church hierarchy. By the time Hithloday has told his entire story, he is completely exhausted. Thomas More, thinking deeply about what he has heard, for better and for worse, takes Hithloday to dinner. Let's examine the two central characters in Utopia, the first of whom is Thomas More. The real Sir Thomas More, Utopia's author and the book's narrator, was one of the most famous men in European history. A writer, lawyer, philosopher, and politician, Moore was declared a Catholic saint in 1935 and described as a Reformation martyr. Utopia, written in 1516, was Moore's most famous work, a groundbreaking book that had a dramatic impact on political philosophy and literature. Utopia blends reality and fiction as Moore meets up with real world friends, great scholars of the time like Peter Giles, and wise imaginary characters like long-winded traveler Raphael Hithloday. Thomas More was a prolific writer. As a young man, he wrote comic plays and many of his later writings took the form of parliamentary speeches and political publications. He also wrote The History of King Richard III in 1557, which is considered to be one of the great works on that subject. Thomas More wrote a number of poems and several theological works in English and Latin. All this backstory is important to understanding why the fictional Thomas More, already well regarded in his time, could function as a reliable narrator who supported England's Tudor hierarchies and criticized Hithloday, who was a covert product of More's imagination. The character of Thomas More is a great listener and debater, 
but often critical or dismissive of Raphael Hithloday's explanation of the ways the utopians do things. This was likely done as a way to distance the real author from the presumed dangerous thoughts he was espousing in the book under the protection of an assumed character. The real Thomas More was eventually executed for his beliefs, but his book Utopia not only challenged Tudor society, but the notion of our societal rules, regulations, and standards in an unprecedented way at the time of its publication. Raphael Hithloday is an entirely imaginary character and a friend of Peter Giles. Hithloday has traveled the world with Amerigo Vespucci and in his travels discovers the hidden country of Utopia. Most of the book is dedicated to Hithloday's description of Utopia. Raphael is likely a critical voice in many cases of logic and reason inside Thomas More's head and creating this thoughtful rhetorical character and placing him at odds with Tudor society allowed More to express views that were highly punishable at the time. In fact, Thomas More's own character, written into Utopia, writes off many of Raphael Hithloday's beliefs and observations about Utopia as absurdity. Let's review the main symbols in Utopia. The first is the island. Utopia is literally and figuratively a separate place or island. And the island is also a symbol for detachment and remains unblemished by the outside world. Utopia was once a peninsula until General Utopus, founder and ruler of Utopia, decided to cut off his new nation from the mainland by digging a 15 mile long channel with help from the local people and his own soldiers. No one believed it could be done at first, but when it was accomplished, the achievement was met with admiration and terror. Utopia exists in an unexplored new world, making it so remote and unlikely. And that means Thomas More can present the island as the symbol of a separate world with unique norms, laws, and ethics that can be explored in a fictionalized and thus unthreatening manner. An island gives Thomas More the ability to create a completely unique world with little or no reference to the realities of England's Tudor life. Another key symbol is gold. Typically, gold is a symbol for treasure and wealth. But Thomas More turns this idea on its head, creating a world in which gold is totally devalued. Ever the utilitarians, utopians rely on functional metals, not shiny stuff. Raphael Hithloday tells a story about a group of outsiders who come to Utopia clothed in gold and jewels and who were laughed at by Utopian children. But gold can be a tool for paying mercenary soldiers or other governments. That way, Utopians can negotiate for whatever they want without losing anything of value. There are a few main ideas in Utopia. The first is property and wealth. When an individual becomes a member of a Catholic religious community, they take a vow of poverty and give up worldly possessions. Thomas More was a man of complex views concerning the ethics of ownership, who grew up apprenticed to a bishop, but later became a wealthy chancellor. Raphael Hithloday debates the proper punishment for a thief that, at the time, was often death arguing that it's unjust because it does nothing to stop others from stealing, nor does it teach the thief to understand why stealing is wrong or how to live without robbing others. Killing is against God's will, so the state carrying out executions is against God, and that's just wrong. Raphael explains that the idea of shared communal property makes theft unnecessary and questions what would happen if things like money or precious metals cease to have value of their own. The idea of a society in which property is shared led, in part, to some of the most important social experiments in human history. The 20th century revolutions in China and Russia, built on ideas espoused by Karl Marx and other like-minded thinkers, first proposed in Utopia. Another main idea is that of the perfect place. Thomas More coined the now ubiquitous term Utopia, which came to mean the perfect place. But is it really that perfect? Utopians are deprived of the ability to act independently by placing them under constant observation. No one can choose idleness, and the threat of enslavement is everywhere. Still, through its perfect society lens, Utopia raises a number of important critical questions about what is best for human beings. 
Are human beings better and happier when they're provided with all they need, or when they're forced to struggle against obstacles to achieve their goals? Is it better for societies to choose their own leaders and represent themselves? Or are they to be led by a single individual or group with a particular vision for that society? Is there glory in fighting or winning wars, or in preventing national death by any means necessary? Crime and punishment is another main idea addressed many times and in different ways throughout Utopia. Raphael Hithloday describes consequences for theft that don't involve executing a criminal for a crime less heinous than murder, arguing that won't convince other potential criminals that the crime isn't worth committing. The laws of Utopia rarely involve the death penalty, yet Utopian laws are quite harsh. Some actions that wouldn't be considered crimes elsewhere are punishable by enslavement in Utopia. Work and industry are highly valued in Utopia, so a man can be enslaved for the crime of wandering the countryside without working or without permission. 